Starfleet Command, this is Captain Kirk. May I speak with Admiral Roddenberry, please? Sir, Captain Kirk, um, I need a few minutes of your time. Um, I am on a uh, first contact mission on a planet called Earth in our nav charts. I arrived here nine Earth days ago, and uh, I've got some really rich intel that I'd like to share with you. Um, the first thing is that I've sheltered in a large fixed structure. I don't know its name, but I see four letters everywhere. PCOB, P-C-O-B. Don't know what it means yet. It's, uh, I've measured it, it's about 25,000 square feet. It's three stories tall. There are lifts on both ends of the building. They are glacially slow. Uh, I got in one and it took seven or eight light years to go two floors. Now, when I arrived, I have a, an analog device called a calendar. I, I met someone who gave this to me. And I arrived on Earth date uh, Monday, 19 March, nine days ago. This structure was completely vacant, except for one individual, one human. His name is Norton. Um, he apparently is uh, what, what we would call at Starfleet Academy, a teacher scholar. And uh, I, I'm in a, a box where he teaches. Um, apparently, this box is often populated by younger humans, and he stands in the front of the box and, I guess, illuminates them. Um, for reasons I don't understand, the younger humans are not here. They are called students. Um, so, um, my excitement is that Norton and I are, are substantially identical on, on every physical dimension. We are the same mass, the same height, we have identical facial structure, tonal qualities, we both have the same hair color, tungsten, and uh, I don't think his mate would, would be able to pick us apart. Hey, that's exciting, she's kind of cute. I'm sorry sir, I'll get back on the mission. Um, the reason this is significant, Norton and I were the only people in the building and we, we struck up a conversation and he invited me to do some sort of a bonding experience. So we got in his ground mobility unit, uh, some sort of a, has a very comfortable cabin and a big cargo bay. And on the back, the name is, is stamped in the skin. It is F Foxtrot 150. So we took his ground mobility unit to this place he has access to where you can deploy blasters. And, and they just do this recreationally here. Part of my excitement, sir, is, is Norton, I swear, has more blasters than all of Starfleet combined. And, uh, and he has a great deal of formal training, military, civilian, law enforcement, a lot of experience. I think, literally, I've approached him about this. I think we should deploy him to that part of the galaxy where the Klingons are. I promise you, he would have complete peace in two or three days. He's willing to do it. The, uh, the only thing he says he needed was rocket fuel, and I said, well, we can do that. But apparently, instead of a propellant for a space vehicle, rocket fuel on Earth is some sort of a beverage that other people call coffee. But I want to explore this with you to see if you'd like to deploy him. Now, because of this similarity and our new kinship, he is permitting me to assume his identity and his role in this structure, teaching younger humans, um, I guess, organizational sciences. We learned that stuff at Starfleet Academy. But so the excitement is that, that I, I have legitimacy, I can stay embedded here, and I can learn a great deal. So I'm hoping you'll consider extending the mission. Um, I've had a chance to explore this structure. Uh, the first floor was absolutely vacant except for Norton's pod. Um, the second floor, there's one larger pod, and there are humans in it, and the signage on the hatch says Dean's Suite. I don't know what that means but I was able to observe them through some sort of glass, a transparent material, and they, uh, they apparently do nothing, 
but there's this enormous sucking sound where they consume resources. I don't yet understand. And then I went to the third floor of this structure and there are six or seven or eight deeply dysfunctional humans. I would try to talk to them, to engage them, but they would just scream and run in their pods and close the hatches. And when they're in there, I, I discovered that I, this was after some observation, for several minutes at a time, they will inhale and exhale blue smoke. Uh, I'm not familiar with it. It has a very pungent odor. But when they come out of the pods, they ask me if I have any Doritos. And I don't know what that is, sir. I wish Spock were here. He would know what a Dorito is. But the signage on the hatches of all of these strange humans says, has the same word. It says economist. Again, I don't yet know what that means, but they are, they are weird. Um, so I'm struggling with the communication and language, sir. I, uh, uh, it's challenging because there's so much variability. Apparently a lot of language is local. Uh, people, although they're quite similar, are very different, and they gather into, into collectives or groups based on behaviors or affinities or whatever. And, and I can't, I, again, I'm struggling. I, uh, I met a man a couple of days ago who knows Norton, and I said, do you know him? And he said, I know, he's a crazy son of a bitch. And I don't know if that's a compliment, or I just simply don't know yet. And then I watched a couple of young men interact. They, they moved towards each other, and as one greeted the other, I, I'm certain I got this correctly, the first young man said to the second, Yo, dog, what it is, homie. And again, I ran that through every database to which we have access, and I can't, I can't discern the meaning. And, and the last thing about communication is there were some young students who saw my Starfleet communicator, and they just roared with laughter. They thought it was some Earth device, some old-school, low-tech thing that they call a flip Phone, but I'm not going to tell them. But most of them have what I thought was a communication device, but I'm not sure. Most of them have a, a small tile, roughly the size of a man's hand, and it glows. And, and when they activate it, it, it just stands a few inches off their noses. And some of them don't speak or do anything for five or six hours at a time. Apparently, they are called liberal arts students. But again, this is all new to me and I'm trying to learn more about, uh, about the communication stuff. So um, again, sir, I'm really hoping that, uh, I'm sorry to intrude, I'm really hoping that, that you will consider extending this mission. Um, I'm embedded, I have legitimacy because Norton has given me a lot of his intellectual properties so that I can present lecture notes and, and uh, other things like that. So uh, please, sir, please consider extending the mission. Uh, thank you, sir. Perk out. Now to work. unmuted. Hey there, Management 4234. I hope y'all are well. I'm, I'm not sure what I'm doing. I'm either practicing social distancing or safe sex. I, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm confused. But it occurs to me, if we are six feet or more apart, that would work pretty well for the safe sex thing. Again, I, I'm, I'm confused. And it's not nice to confuse old people. We forget to take our meds, we wander off. So I, I just need to get some clarity what we're supposed to be doing. Today, what you and I are doing is, um, in our syllabus, it will be session 21. Again, the dates are irrelevant. This is session 21. What we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about chapter 13 in the textbook, and it's a chapter about venture capital. It takes a pretty deep dive. So um, there is, um, 
I'm going to be doing some, some whiteboard stuff. Uh, I, I know that it'll be, I'll make it clear. Um, perhaps the writing won't be, but I'll make whatever I put on the board abundantly clear to you. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is there's a stage model. Uh, it's Exhibit 13-1 in this chapter, and, and it's useful, but it's coarse. Uh, I, I just don't think that it really captures the essential features of venture capital. So I want to put something on the board which I think would actually be a, an improved stage model. Give me just a moment. So, everything on the whiteboard is in view of the screen. Darn. <sighs> yes, I just touched my face, but I also just washed my hands before I came in here. Um, so I want to run through that this, this is an extension of that Exhibit 13-1 in the early part of Chapter 13. One, two, three, four. I'm suggesting that there are four component pieces to this venture capital funding. The first stage I'm calling exploration. When I say exploration, that's going to be funded only by the founders. That is going to be you doing some preliminary market research, uh, whipping up a prototype or building a beta site, or doing something that you can take to people who are potential users and say, what do you think of this device? Um, or, or, or service, uh, service piece. So that's one stage and the money always comes from the founders. The second stage is proof of concept. If what you find is promising, if there seems to be a market interest in what you would like to bring to the market, um, you have to prove the concept. Uh, that could take a lot of forms. That could take uh, literally you getting stuff out there in the form of a pilot study or any number of things like that. Um, literally giving people stuff to destroy. Um, a beta site kind of a technique. The money for this proof of concept stage would come from founders, family, and friends, people close to the, to the new venture team, and sometimes angel investors. We'll talk about angels in a few minutes later today. The third stage, and what I'm doing is I'm making this simplistic. I'm saying rounds one through four. I've actually seen companies get acquired for big stupid money after a single round of venture capital. And I've seen companies like WeWork and, and uh, uh, Wayfair go decades, uh, multiple rounds. So, but typically, companies that have high growth potential and high wealth creating potential will have perhaps one to four rounds of venture capital funding. That permits them to launch the business and grow it. When I say grow it, I mean get scale, expand beyond a local or regional market and that sort of thing. Now, the money almost exclusively for these rounds one through four comes from venture capitalists. What I have on the board is VCs. Um, in my world, that means Viet Cong. Uh, and then the last, the last stage that I want to talk about, this, uh, this is a, a three-letter pseudo-acronym. It's IPO. It means Initial Public Offering. That's what happens when a firm goes public. It lists its stock on an exchange like NASDAQ or Amex or, or something like that. And 
Um, the monies there are provided by investment bankers or, or investment funds. Uh, and of course, sometimes individuals buy stock as well. But usually on IPO, it, it's, it's funds and bankers. Now, the other alternative to this final stage is instead of listing a company to have its stock publicly traded on an exchange, many companies successfully actively look to be acquired. That says acquisition. So the harvest strategy, the, the source of funds, would be to either list the company and go public or be acquired by some big firm. And, and that's what the last thing says. This is meant to stay, say, big biz. So all I want to do is, is I wanted to bring to life to you that uh, Exhibit 13.1, but I've, I've modified it just nominally. Now, today I, I plan to, I think I mentioned this, I'm gonna talk about six concepts that come out of chapter 13. And the next one that I would share with you is something that the authors talk about. They talk about preserving your equity. And I'm not sure that's achievable. Let me get rid of this uh, stage model because I need some more board space and I need to say stentor so the camera can capture this. <sighs> my, my disagreement is, uh, isn't just philosophical, it's empirical. I have a great deal of evidence to suggest this. What they say in the text is they want you, the founding team, to preserve your equity. That's not the bargain that you make. When you have private equity, the people who provide that equity give you cash and in exchange, they expect some fractional ownership. This is not a gift, it's not charity. It is a bargained exchange. Uh, they give you cash that makes it essential for you to launch, grow, build, whatever it is that you're gonna do but they expect ownership in exchange. And uh, in addition to that, um, well, all I'm saying is I think this, this notion of preserving your equity is unachievable. I wanna give you an example, I'm gonna put it on the whiteboard because I think this is useful. For a number of years I taught at the University of Louisville and there was a very vibrant uh, entrepreneurial and venture capital community in that city. And I, I made a friend, a guy named Kent Euler, who's probably been involved in 15 high growth ventures. He and two, two co-ventures took one of these companies public. The name of the company was High Speed Access. And uh, this goes back to, gosh, maybe the middle 90s, perhaps? I don't remember the dates. But what High Speed Access did is High Speed Access provided last mile connectivity. If, if, um, if, a, if a big building, if a multi-family apartment complex or, or an office tower or something like that, if it were wired for internet, what HSA did, what High Speed Access did is they provided that last mile connectivity. They literally wired the building so that, so that the, the people there could be internet users, they'd have access. And, and 15 or 20 years ago, that was big stuff. So HSA, High Speed Access, had four rounds of venture capital funding in two and a half years. Um, they, they went from nothing to, to going public in two and a half years, which was quite remarkable. The only round that I remember in terms of magnitude, the fourth round of venture capital funding was slightly over 90 million. I don't remember precisely the amount, but it was over 90 million. But what I want to share with you is, is this whole notion of my, my, my disagreement with the authors when they say preserve your equity. <clears throat> Each of the four rounds, every time a venture capitalist gave money to high-speed access to the founding group, every time they did that, the founding group surrendered equity. They surrendered stock ownership. So here's where this thing started. At inception, there were three owners on the venture team and they owned, unsurprisingly, 100% of the stock. Nice place to be. Four rounds of venture capital funding. When the company went public at the IPO, they had sold 93% of the stock across those four venture capital rounds. So the same three members of the founding venture team, when the company went public, owned 7% of the stock. Now, you may know this because you're pretty bright people. 
The Securities and Exchange Commission, when a company goes public, has a lock-in. And, and anyone that, that's a member of the founding group when the company goes public cannot sell her or his stock for six months. Apparently, way back in time, there were instances where, where venture teams would go public, get the money, and then leave, and the entire venture collapsed, which essentially is a species of fraud. So, um, I put my communicator away. So, when the company went public, the same three members of the venture team, their ownership interests had decreased from 100% to 7 but when this lock-in expired, when the six months were over, their 7% of the stock was worth $150 million, which is not quite as much as I make each semester, but it's kind of close. So the, the point is this, this notion that's, that's introduced in the chapter about preserving your equity is simply unachievable. Um, Nobody is gonna give you money and get nothing in exchange for it. So, so the, obvious, the obvious point is, would you rather have a small piece of a huge pie or 100% of nothing? And that's generally easy for us to answer. Now, um, the third concept that I want to talk about, um, I want to talk to you about venture capitalists as a community. Um, they are by far, it's a tiny community, but they are by far the most visible source of equity funding. The first thing that I should tell you about venture capitalists, I'm going to have to go ahead to my notes, is I'd like to tell you a little bit about how a venture capital firm is structured, how it's organized, how it operates. Uh, venture capital firms are just funds, they're investment funds of private equity. Uh, typically, there'll be two or three principals who start a venture capital firm. And uh, they will literally approach private investors and they'll say, here are our intentions. We, we intend to create a fund of $200 million or whatever it would be. We plan to invest in companies in these industries. We're looking for this sort of return. We would expect to be able to uh, convert our investments, our portfolio companies into cash in every five years or something like that. So there'll be significant cash to distribute. So they literally, they, the principals in this early stage venture capital firm, this private investment fund, go to private investors and they create a pool of capital. Now. Some of these things are relatively small. I'm aware of a, of a venture capital fund in Louisville that, that literally only had $10 million in funding. When I say only, that's, that's significant, but not in that domain. There are others, like there's a firm named Cerebus that has multiple funds that are billions of dollars each. So um, venture capital firms are essentially private equity funds. They, they get private equity capital and, and they, they agree to, to judiciously invest those funds in companies that permit them to achieve certain financial goals. Uh, and I'll tell you what they expect, what they'll tell their investors. They'll say, we're looking for 100 to 1 returns. And it turns out that happens every once in a while. But the reality is, if, if, they, could, if they could find any company that they thought could achieve a, a 3 to 1 return on their investment or a 5 to 1 return, I promise you they'd take it. Good business ventures get funding. So this thing about 100 to 1 is, is uh, it's a moonshot. It happens occasionally, but, but it doesn't happen very often. So I want to talk to you a little bit structurally about venture capital firms, and now I want to go back about some attributes that you would see in venture capital firms. The first thing that I would share with you <coughs> is that most of them tend to specialize, and they specialize in industries where the principles in the venture capital firm have domain competence. Um, if, for example, I, I had been very successful in telecom or biomedical devices or something like that, if I were very successful and I harvested a business, I might want to take those monies, form a private equity fund, and invest. But I would only invest in industries where I know a great deal about them. So venture capitalists tend to limit their investments to domains where they have a great deal of, of knowledge. That's the first thing that's useful. Um, the second thing is every one of them, every venture capital firm on the planet, I think, has what I would call exclusion rules. There are types of businesses they won't consider. I have a, a treasured friend, now retired, his name is Carl Vesper. 
Uh, he started life as an engineer. He at some point became a college professor. He later became uh, a successful venture capitalist. Uh, he, had a, he had a firm that was based in Seattle. And uh, because I know Carl well, I know his two exclusion rules. There are two types of companies he wouldn't consider investing in. If your venture, your concept, is going to do anything whatsoever that involves servicing a student population, he, he wouldn't even consider it. And, and I know his reasoning. His reasoning is oftentimes students don't make decisions. Oftentimes the people who are supporting them, families make decisions. Uh, they don't typically make decisions on buying new cars and, and things like that until they're out of school and, and, and independently engaged and living. So he wouldn't do anything that, that serviced a student population, no interest, doesn't matter what the concept is, because he didn't think the decision making rested with the students. Right or wrong, that was, that was his rule. The other thing that, that he wouldn't invest in, he wouldn't invest in any venture, and, and these were his words, if whatever you're selling goes down somebody's neck. If you had a restaurant concept, a bar concept, anything like that, he has no interest. I guess it's not because he doesn't know anything about them, I guess he just had the notion that those are such hyper-competitive environments that it's very difficult to launch a business, scale it up, and be successful. It happens, but, it, but it, it's almost like unicorns. Um, so my point is that every venture capital firm has exclusionary rules or some things they won't consider. That's sort of the flip side of domain competence. But uh, Carl's were simple. Nothing if it related students, nothing if it related to anything that went down our necks. The third thing I want to talk to you about is uh, if a venture capital firm invests in your business, that firm will expect seats on the board because the board is a truly significant governance mechanism in any corporation. The board literally hires or discharges all of the senior executives. Uh, Steve Jobs was once fired from Apple because the board was, was displeased with what he was doing. That's happened often, where, where, an, where someone who is entrepreneurial will launch a business, and when the business gets big and cumbersome and requires technical expertise, the vision of the founder doesn't necessarily match up with all of the, the complex demands of this huge and functioning organization. So um, all venture capitalists will expect seats on the board, because that way they get to make really significant decisions that, that impact what goes on. And they're the ones who are heavily invested, so it's legitimate that they, that they have that role. Um, thing number four on venture capitalists. The, uh, my experience is that, that most of them add considerable value beyond money. Uh, they, they, can, they can make introductions because they're all embedded in networks. They know people in banking and financial services, and private equity, and others in industries. And, and uh, they can make enormous introductions. Oftentimes they can, they can augment, they can help you round out your new venture team with people who have uh, experience and, and success and competence. Uh, so venture capitalists have a, a great, they add a great deal more value than simply providing capital. Uh, it's a profoundly important relationship and it should never be adversarial. It's always negotiated, but it should never be adversarial. The last thing, I shouldn't say the last thing, but in this particular concept, when I talk to you about observations about venture capitalists, no, it's not the last thing. It's the next thing. Every venture capital firm on the planet invests in stages. You, the new venture team, and they, the private equity financiers, will agree on milestones. Here's what you need to accomplish next that's significant. We'll give you enough funding to get there. If you achieve that milestone, y'all will agree on the next one. And again, when you achieve that, you'll get funding. So, so the point is that uh, they don't just say, here's a check on limited funds. They will fund every venture in which they invest in stages. And the stages will be on achievable milestones that you and they agree upon. This is nothing that they force feed because you're the ones that have to implement. You're the ones that have to pull this thing off. It could be, patent applications, uh, achieving market share, certain revenue targets. There are any number of things that could be, that could take the form of these milestones. Um, I would also point out, as we talk about venture capital firms, that um, the process 
of you actually obtaining venture capital is time consuming. I'm sure it's frustrating. Uh, there will be many denials, many presentations, and a large part of that is fit. A large part of that is finding a private equity financier that, that has keen interest in what you're doing. Um, but but it, it's a frustrating process and uh, uh, you just need to be aware of that when you go in. And I want to give you a little bit of uh, macro data on the venture capital community, sort of an overview. Um, in the United States, there, there's a guide called Pratt's Guide, P-R-A-T-T-S, Pratt's Guide. And, and it typically is a directory of all active venture capital firms. And I'm sure it changes with some frequency. But uh, at any point in time in the US, there are only maybe 700 venture capital firms that are structured and organized. And um, again, more macro data. The data suggests that less than 1% of the, of the business plans that they see are funded. I have a specific example I'm going to take you through in a moment. And of those that are funded, greater than 70% of them fail. So even what the venture capitalist would think is, is, is the most optimal circumstance, the best, most thoughtful, most carefully developed decision and investment, even among that 1%, 70% of them fail. Um, so now, Simply because of the presentation of the chapter, I think I'm on page 301, there's a good discussion in the text about uh, angels, and, and I really want to just share two things with you about angels at this point. The first is to define them, and then I want to give you a, an example that's contemporary and, and, and pretty exciting because it, it, it speaks to successful relationships between angel investors and entrepreneurs. I. Uh, the definition of an angel is, is utterly simple. An angel is nothing other than an informal investor. Not somebody that has a business, that has structure, that has analysts, that has staff. It's someone who's been successful in life. They could have been successful in business. They could have been, they could have been entrepreneurial and harvested a business and are looking for something to do. But as somebody who is relatively affluent, who has investable capital, who's had some success in life, who's interested in informally investing. And uh, I guess I have two stories I can share with you. Um, the first one I want to talk about is Texas Roadhouse. Texas Roadhouse is, is in the casual dining space. It, it, it uh, gosh, I think the company may be 26, 27 years old. I think its first restaurant might have opened in perhaps 1992 or something like that. And uh, now, it has uh, hundreds of restaurants in something like 35 states. It's a multi-billion dollar a year company. But it was a relatively long climb. I think it might have been uh, 14, 15 years between the time the company started a single store restaurant until it went public. I think it might have gone public in perhaps 2007 or 2008. So the founder of Texas Roadhouse is a delightful man named Kent Taylor. Uh, I got to know Kent well because when I was at IU, go Hosers. I was at IU for three years and Kent for one year was our entrepreneur in residence. And I got to know the guy and he was really a neat man. And then when I joined the faculty at the University of Louisville, Texas Roadhouse's uh, corporate headquarters are located in Louisville. So I had a lot of direct connection with, uh, with Kent and his senior staff. And it was really good. It was really uh, delightful that I could I could interact and, and benefit from that. So, Kent was partnered with a man named John Y. Brown III in a single store restaurant in Louisville. It was a steakhouse called Buckheads, right on the Ohio River, nice place. But John Y. was a very, very affluent man and had no interest in, in working hard and growing a business. Uh, Kent was hungry. He had a fire in his belly. And uh, he had a lot of experience. My memory is that he might have, he worked at Applebee's, I guess, and growing through a variety of managerial roles, maybe 15 years or so. And at some point he just decided to punch out. He, he no longer saw what he thought was a good way forward. So he's, uh, he's partnering with John Y with this single steakhouse in Louisville. And John Y doesn't have any interest in growing a business, but Kent does. So turns out that Kent had three regular customers. They were physicians 
who, who lived in, and worked in a neighboring town, a town called Elizabethtown, maybe 60 miles away from Louisville. And they would regularly come to Louisville for dinner, drinks, so weekend shopping, sports, that kind of a thing. So Ken got to know these three docs over time because they were regular customers. And, and he made an effort to, to interact with all of his customers, regular or, or otherwise. And at some point, Ken laid out a vision to these three men. They happened all to be men. And he said, here's what I want to do. I want to, I want to launch a steakhouse chain and uh, I want to grow it and I want it to be publicly held and I want it to have a, a nationwide presence. Now, I would, wouldn't touch that. And the reason I wouldn't touch that is not so much that I'm risk averse or that I don't have investable capital, but the reason I wouldn't touch it is casual dining is just so crowded. It is so hyper competitive. Think of all the restaurants that are in casual dining. IHOP is in casual dining, but it's primarily a breakfast place and they don't serve alcohol. Um, think of all the steakhouses. How do you, if you're gonna put dead cow on a plate, how can you differentiate that? How can you do something that's notably different from another restaurant that puts dead cow on a plate? So it's in a hyper-competitive industry that's really crowded, lots of, lots of competitors in that space. And it strikes me that it would be impossible to differentiate your business from, from your competitors. So I, I wouldn't invest in that. But these three docs didn't feel the way that I did. So over the course of just a few years, when Kent launched this business that, that is Texas Roadhouse, these three docs invested together, the three of them together, a million bucks over a few years in the early stages of this business. And they were patient and, and Kent kept his promises. He grew the business, successful, controlled, but he was on the trajectory that he, he wanted. And uh, again, 2007, 2008, the company went public. And uh, after the six month lock-in expired, these three doctors owned 11% of the stock of this company. Uh, of course, it was diluted because other people had come in as investors, but uh, that $1 million investment today, is, as I speak to you, is 11% of a vibrant, thriving, publicly held company. So, so angel investors can just do some remarkable things, but if you look about the doctors, they are informal investors. They've been very successful practicing in, 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 life, in healthcare and life sciences, and, and they had investable income, and, and they built, built a relationship with Kent, and that's precisely what, uh, what, how it turned out then. So, so angel investors are informal investors, and, and uh, they tend to be a wonderful source of, of uh, private equity, but there has to be some relationship, there has to be some compatibility. They don't just fall out of heaven. I should have, I, I see a comment in my lecture notes that I should have mentioned when I was talking about venture capital firms structurally. Uh, so this is just out of order, but it's important. This doesn't surprise me, but a lot of large organizations have in-house venture capital funding. A number of years ago, UPS had a public offering and it sold about $6 billion worth of stock. And at the time that was enormous, that was gargantuan. We have a sub shop in town, isn't it Larry's Gargantuan Subs? Is that what it is? So when UPS went public, it set aside some portion of, of the proceeds from this, from this initial public offering, and it created an internal venture capital fund. So if you're a UPS employee, and you have what you think is a neat idea, you can bring it, you can pitch it to the internal fund, and they may fund it, and you will have some equity interest in it. Similarly, though this is an internal fund to UPS, other companies in logistics and supply chain management will come to UPS with a similar proposal. They'll say, here's something we'd like to do, here's what we need for funding, and, and if there is some shared understanding and some shared benefit, then, then they'll do it. So a lot of big organizations have internal venture capital funding. When I was at U of L, um, this is uh, 12, 15 years ago, at the time, the University of Louisville had a foundations account of about $550 million, and three million of that was set aside as an internal venture capital fund. 
and, and uh, they would invest in like uh, MBA students that had really cool ideas and, and uh, uh, perhaps faculty, I'm not sure if they invested in faculty ideas, but um, Louisville did not have a medical school, but it had a, a vibrant uh, engineering school. And a lot of the faculty at the speed school, the engineering school at Louisville, were, uh, were knowledge providers. They, they would uh, patent things and, and, and it would be pretty successful. So my point is that a lot of large organizations have an internal funding source. So if you have venture ideas, you can take them to, to the people in finance. Ah, the last concept I want to share with you is, is, uh, is just, it's anecdotal. Um, I have a dear friend um, who practiced law for a number of years and then left law to go into private equity financing. And he and two other individuals started a venture capital fund in, in Louisville. And uh, there will be no identities revealed in this conversation. But I asked my friend Steve once if he could share with me what, what venture capitalists call deal flow. How many deals you look at, how many do you fund, what are the timelines? So, most venture capital funds, literally, would have a, a group of principals. They are the partners, if you will, who founded this organization, and they take primary responsibility for its, for its operation. And uh, of course, they always hire people who look just like you. They hire people that are high speed, bright, right out of school to be financial analysts. And if a business plan comes in, they will assign it to you as the analyst, and you'll spend a week or 10 days just ripping it apart. A sensitivity analysis, worst case scenarios, best case scenarios. And after you've had time to immerse yourself in it, you'll show up at a staff meeting, whatever that happens, and you will present this plan to the partners along with a recommendation. So the analyst would say, um, I, I uh, doubled the cost and cut the revenues in half and it still seems to work, or this is unachievable, or it's at a stage where they need intellectual property protection and they don't have it. So you will present this thing along with a recommendation and, and they will decide if they want to pursue it or not. But um, a lot of opportunities, although there aren't that many venture capital firms, the, the number, all of them have uh, financial analysts who are you. They are people that tend to come out of school with uh, well equipped with business skills and you're in a position to look at, at these uh, business plans and, and make some neat, insightful recommendations. So Steve told me that this is a relatively small fund. He told me that they would get a thousand submissions a year that were unsolicited. Sometimes people who were in portfolio companies would come to them. Sometimes they would get a referral from someone known to them but he tell, told me that they would get a uh, thousand submissions a year. That's a big deal flow. If there are 50 weeks in a year, doesn't that mean 200 a week? Uh, just that many submissions a year to, to, for the analyst to work on. Now, after the analysts, his analysts would review these funds and make recommendations, they would exclude 850. They simply didn't meet the criteria. They were underdeveloped or poorly done or whatever the case may be. Um, that meant that they would actively consider 150, that's about 15% of the, of the submissions that came in. Of the 150 that they would actively consider, they would bring in new venture teams and have lots of, uh, of interaction and questions and say, we need these data, whatever the case may be. Um, they would typically, in the course of any year, only invest in three to five. So from 1,000 plans, in the door to five plans funded is a very big gap. And uh, again, I just, I wanted to, because I had this, I had access to these data from a friend of mine who was a, a partner in a venture capital firm. I wanted to share that with you. So I um, think that that represents everything that I wanted to talk to you about in chapter 13. I hope I've managed the time well. My intention is to try the standard 30 minutes, but I want you to, um, I want you to remember that I've asked you, literally asked you to engage in self-study. Uh, every time we have a session meeting like this, I want you to dedicate about 45 minutes of, of study where you reread the chapter, highlight it, journal, make notes. That reinforces your learning and prepares you for exams. Um, so, I, uh, when I walked up to the camera at the start of the session, I, I realized 
that I hadn't I hadn't muted a conversation I was having earlier with my my boss and uh, for that reason the question that I want you to answer when you toggle in with an email to demonstrate that you viewed this video and you paid attention it, it's a fairly simple question you may remember that I've assumed the role and the identity of, of your professor Norton and, and uh, the question is, how many blasters does Norton have? So, love you, and uh, I'll be back with session 22 soon. Be well.